Those that don't uh, know me, my name is Kevin Brady, and I'm the founder of Advoca Health, um, which we'll talk about Advoca Health a bit later. But um, we essentially help people find the best health solutions locally and in the world, um, which is why we're bringing you this information today. Um, just like to introduce our team, we've got two members of our team here, Asta Sani, who's, who's our vice president. Uh, so Asta, welcome. And we've also got Vanessa, who's our director of marketing. Uh, with us as well that's gonna, uh, going to help us. Um, as uh, they noted, please, any questions that, you know, that uh, as we go through the presentation to myself or Dr. Venter, uh, please just use the uh, chat function. And once again, Asta did mention it's going to be recorded, um, just so everyone's aware. Okay. Um, so just to give you a real brief background before we get into the, the topic today, my what I consider, I guess, my purpose or my mission is to help people uh, find the very best health solutions so they can live a very long and healthy life. And that's exactly what we do at Advoca, is help people find the very best health solutions so they, in turn, can live a long uh, and healthy life. Which um, So through our network, we are very fortunate to have with us today uh, Dr. Ventner, who is at Health Code, and Health Code is one of our partners that specializes in longevity and uh, functional medicine. And I'm super excited to have Dr. Venter uh, with, uh, with us today. Um, I consider him, and many in, in this field, consider him one of, one of the leaders in the world in terms of functional medicine and uh, longevity. Um, I'm just going to just uh, read out a bit of his bio, just so people have some background. So he's uh, uh, Dr. Venter is the co-founder and medical director of Health Code and Health Code FX. He is the chief medical officer at Health Tech Connex, which is a BC-based neurotechnology company. He's also a family and functional medicine uh, physician uh, out of BC, and he obtained his medical degree and master's degree in family medicine at the University of Orange Free State in South Africa. As one of the first candidates to graduate in the Institute for Functional Medicine's certification program, Dr. Ventner is uniquely trained in functional medicine and lifestyle medicine to identify and treat the root cause of chronic disease. Dr. Ventner is alumna, an alumni of Exponential Medicine and Singularity University with a keen interest in biohacking and exponential technologies like regenerative medicine, stem cells, longevity, neurotechnology, flow straits, small molecules, et cetera, that we're going to hear a lot about today. Um, so I'll, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Venter in a couple of uh, moments here. Uh, but Vanessa, if you could please go to the next slide, because I just to set up today's talk, um, you've probably heard, and the reason many of you are probably on this call, because we've heard about lifespan uh, versus health span. And, you know, typically, as you can see by the top uh, chart there, many people in this world, unfortunately, you know, live, a, live, let's say, a fairly long life, but the last third of their life is spent with illness and disease. And, and it's, you know, many people think that uh, those things just go along with aging. I'm a firm believer that if you pay attention to certain things in your life, you can not only eliminate disease or reverse it. And that's really what today's about. And hopefully our goal is that you can come away with some very um, uh, concrete examples of things you can do today to increase your longevity and not just longevity, but living long and healthy. So the first thing I'm going to, um, uh, I'll just turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Ventner. And uh, I think he's got a, a, a cartoon to start things off. So Dr. Ventner, again, welcome. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Kevin, and your team, and thank you, everybody, for taking some time out of your busy schedule to learn how to live, hopefully, a little bit longer and gracefully, and as Kevin said, compress that morbidity so that your last third of your life, actually, you can have fun with yourself and your partner and your, your family and friends. So, um, as Kevin said, I'm a, a specialist in functional medicine, and people always ask, oh, so what is functional medicine? So this is this cartoon by Randy Glasberg and illustrate uh, really one of the key um, factors here about root causes. So the lady is saying to a chiropractor, the pain starts in my husband's lower back, then it travels up his spine to his neck, and then come out of his mouth and into my ears. And that's why I get these headaches. 
So functional medicine is really about finding the root causes. Um, and uh, it's a new field of medicine um, that sort of set up to help us address the challenges of the new, um, uh, uh, basically really the new um, millennium. Uh, Vanessa, next slide, please. So functional medicine is a science-based personal, uh, personalized healthcare uh, system based on systems biology. It came out of uh, biochemistry background. Uh, it's about 40 years old. Uh, as I said, it looks at the root cause of illness, um, specifically looking at advanced labs, advanced imaging, and just spending a bit more time with the patient. Um, we do look at individually tailored therapies. And we specifically trying to restore health uh, function and health structure, uh, stru uh, structure uh, to, uh, and specifically then to improve function. We look at the environment and specifically the gene interaction with that environment uh, in a field we call epigenetics to see how we can influence the core physiological systems like the mitochondria and detox and the gut function uh, and the microbiome, which is a, a pretty big big subject. Um, next, up, uh, next slide, please, Vanessa. So the functional, whoops, I please go back to, yeah. So the functional medicine um, system can be basically summarized as a tree uh, where we look at the roots, the soil, the um, influence of, of, of the environment like water and air, uh, pollution, all that, and um, in the, in the core route, you can see there, we look at things like your social network, yeah, trauma, what are your um, pollutants? Uh, do you have any resiliency, um, et cetera? Whereas modern medicine is very uh, great in looking at the tip of the tree or the tip of the branch, tip of the leaf. Um, we got amazing specialists in say cardiac medicine where you can find somebody that concentrate on valve lesions of five-year-olds or six-month-olds, but they, they don't look at the root causes and that's where functional medicine comes in. But Dr. Van Der, if I can just comment, I mean, I think we all know that we're in a health system that is very reactionary, right? So basically, and I hate to say it's, it's you know, we, as a, as a society, we wait till something is broken and then we try to fix it. And often it's a Band-Aid. And a Band-Aid may be you go on cholesterol medication for the rest of your life or you go on blood pressure medication for the rest of your life. And I guess I just want to comment what, what my definition of functional medicine is, is determining those underlying any issues before they happen, right? So proacting on health versus reacting on health. So is that a, is that a good layman's term summary? That's a good summary. Um, I had a patient comment on me last week. He said he loves functional medicine. He calls it offensive medicine. That's and awesome. Defensive. Yeah, I thought that's a good word. If it yeah. wasn't such an offensive term. Yeah, yeah. Super. Um, Vanessa, we're just going to... So this is for everybody that's on this call. Um, we've got 10 different topics to talk about, and there's no way we're going to possibly get through 10 topics today. So we really want you to vote as to what you would say uh, is the most interesting topic that you're most interested in today. And it could be everything from heart health, which is the number one uh, killer right now in, in the world, to cancer, which is number two. Um, how many votes do they get, Vanessa? Uh, one, one, one vote. Oh, one vote each, that's it? <laughs> okay. So if we can and have- we'll pick the top. Yeah, we'll pick the top three and then we'll address those. So I already see a few of you have commented on brain health, heart health, immune You just health. click on it in the chat box and press submit. That's all you need to do. Yep. Okay, we'll give it maybe 30 more seconds. Yep. Who are, what's leading so far? Heart health. Uh, uh, five of us want to talk about heart health. Three uh, about brain health. And then a close second is mental health. Mental health. Okay, good. Good. We'll give it just a couple of seconds more. Hopefully, everyone's loaded. Because cancer isn't up there because cancer is such a big, unfortunately, uh, disease uh, in yeah. right now. Um, yeah, and Kevin, what we can do is we can also see how far we go and we can always, yeah. um, we can always address, address a bit of other things. Mm -hmm.
Okay, good. Um, so what's number one? So we're gonna end the polling here. We're gonna share the results just so that everyone can see them. So heart health, number one for sure. Six of us wanted to talk about it um, or hear about it. Um, and brain health and a closed third is mental health. Okay, so heart health, brain and- Brain mental and mental health together, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I went through the vinyls and check mark on top of your, uh, on your sticky notes of which one I liked, the ones you liked, okay? Yeah, I remember that's not the full list. Like they have more. Okay, cool. We have some custom support online. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Venter, if we could maybe start with heart health, because that seemed to be the uh, the the leading, uh, I'll, I'll call it, issue that people want addressed. And, and again, as we both know, it is the number one killer out there, cardiovascular health. So if you can maybe dive into that, that would be great. Yeah, no, absolutely. I uh, totally agree. Heart health, very important. And I think most people, either personal or a family or a friend story of people have been checked out and say, oh, you're completely fine. And then they have a myocardial infarction in the uh, locker room at the golf club or, or uh, uh, golf or golf course or in the gym or out running uh, after a doctor just said, oh, you're completely fine. I'll see you in two years. So um, heart health also looks at uh, the blood vessels uh, specifically and uh, stroke usually, although stroke is more part of brain health, I would uh, really put stroke in there as well because uh, they, they have the same risk factor. So, so the, the, the first uh, part that we would look at with heart health is really looking at cholesterol. And uh, we thought that cholesterol was really um, the be and end all of cardiac health. And as soon as we give somebody that have high cholesterol, um, uh, cholesterol blocker which is called a statin, uh, that will solve everything. And unfortunately it's just not that easy. At least half of the heart attacks out there, people have normal cholesterol. So there are other risk factors. And a colleague of mine um, in the States, Dr. Mark uh, Houston, he has found at uh, 300 plus biomarkers we have to look at and, and the average GP just don't have the time to even do one test, forget about 300 tests. So, so the, uh, we've been looking at advanced lipids for the last 10, 20 years. And in the summary, it's just look, it's a blood test. Instead of looking at just the amount of cholesterol, you look at the size of cholesterol. So quantified lipidology, or just basically looking at the size of the cholesterol and Interesting enough, it's not the big, large molecules of cholesterol that kills you. It's the small, rusted, I call it like bullets, uh, almost like lead. Uh, those are the ones that damage your uh, cardiovascular system, specifically your, um, your layer of your arteries called the endothelial uh, lining. So that's a really important test to do. And it's in the States, it's very, very easy to get even a GP's office. In Canada, it's an extra step or two that you have to get through an advanced uh, clinic like ourselves. Um, the second thing about heart health, uh, which is quite fascinating, is looking at endothelial function. And endothelial function is the lining of the inside of your arteries that makes nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is what dilates the blood vessel. So basically increases in size and that, so that the heart can pump more blood to that size of uh, that uh, part of the, the body or the tissue. Um, nitric oxide is the reason that Viagra works. And for those of you may, may not have heard the story, Viagra was originally developed to help with uh, lung and heart health in babies and premature babies. And then they, they found that there was some side effects and that has become one of the top top sellers now of uh, pharmaceutical drugs in the last 20 25 years so so at uh, health code we measure the endothelial function because that's really the first thing that goes wrong um, before you're going to have a heart disease before you have say uh, a clot build up or a stroke and it's a 15 minute uh, test uh, non-invasive it's basically a blood pressure cuff device that uh, blows up around your arm. Uh, it stresses the endothelial lining. Whether we certainly and then 
depending on how healthy your lining is, uh, it will release nitric oxide and we can um, measure the amount of nitric oxide that your body releases by seeing what is the temperature change and temperature changes in your hands. Other uh, ways of looking at is to look at um, pressure changes. And then if you really uh, excited to do it, you can also do it in lab, but they have to put a, a catheter in the, in the arm. So not, uh, not the, uh, 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 the best way to do it in a lab, but we can now do it clinically. And I don't like to measure things that we can't change or manage. Um, for everything like the endothelial function, there's a, there's a treatment out there. And certainly if you have a low endothelial function, we need to go delve down and see, okay, what is the root cause of the low endothelial function, which predicts heart disease, say at least 10 years out. Uh, and these are things like increasing nitrates in your diet. Um, things like beetroot is a, is a very big one or uh, purple spinach, which is a thing. So um, any questions on that so far? I don't want this to be too much of a lecture. I want it to be more of a sort of interactive workshop. So if there's any questions from Kevin or the- Yeah, I'll just comment. I, I mean, I was one of those individuals. Unfortunately, my dad was told that he had, he was fit and didn't, was on no medications and went for a stress test and literally a week later died um, of a massive heart attack, right? So he unfortunately was one of those individuals that was told he was in great shape and everything else. And obviously there were things going on inside him that tests would have revealed. <clears throat> so just to, and through again, so Health Code is a partner of ours, but also I personally visit Health, health Code myself. But just to share, I mean, um, one of the te tests that I know is done at Health Code is, and I've had done is genetic testing. So my genetics actually tell me that I am personally predisposed to heart disease, right? And I think the, the feeling out there in, is a lot of people just think, oh, I'm predisposed, so I, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. The reality is there's a lot you can do about it through diet and through pro proper exercise. And the last test I had done on my arterial health, which is actually, you, you know, the age of your arteries, I was 12 years younger. So I was 47, right? Instead of 59, right? So it's just, I share that because I, I think a lot, I think society thinks, oh, I'm genetically predisposed to that. So there's nothing I can do about it. And there's a lot of things you can do about it, right? So question for you, Dr. Rentner is, if, if I had to choose diet or exercise to have heart health, Put you on the spot which one if you could only do one of those two things which one are you going to do i was going to say both to make it easy <laughs> uh you need to eat healthy on the treadmill <laughs> yeah yeah the the, uh, the diet uh probably exercise i would say um because they they when you exercise you manufacture about three thousand different small molecules which most people, even of a healthy diet, I think it's going to be tough to get that. Um, so probably if I can exercise in a nutrition about a half a millimeter behind it. Okay. So it's both, really, yeah, it's, so, it's the same thing. But, yeah, both, uh, are, both are super important is what you're saying. Super important, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Asta, I can't see the chat box. Do we have any other questions or Vanessa? Anybody, any questions for Dr. Renner? No. Okay. No, uh, no questions yet. So we're definitely. Although, yeah, if there's any questions, just put it in the chat bar, uh, box and then we'll, uh, we'll get linked. Um, so the next one was uh, brain health, which is actually listed as number two there. So it may be yeah, maybe, maybe before we go into brain health, I'll just, because uh, I've got a couple of other things just for uh, heart health I wanted to talk about. And I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. What I um, really wanted to say, because it, it links up with brain health um, and the, the buzzword is really uh, perfusion um, or um, blood flow. Um, so it's very important, of course, your heart, which is more than just a pump, but uh, it has, it has uh, it's basically, it makes hormones and, and all kinds of other chemicals that keeps us alive. But, uh, in essence, it started as a pump. And if the arteries are blocked and you can't get the blood to the brain, that, that's obviously a big problem for, for, um, for brain health. And it's, it's one of the massive risk factors for um, things like Alzheimer's and of course, stroke. Um, so there's a new field out there called radiomics. Um, 
specifically looking at um, features of, a, of a imaging, uh, whether it's an MRI or CT scan, X-ray, ultrasound, and extracting these features that are not possible to be viewed by the naked eye, meaning radiologists can't see it, even if they spend hours and hours on that. So, so it's a fascinating field. Uh, radiomics is really driven by uh, big data, um, faster machine learning, artificial intelligence, faster computers, quantum computers, all that. So, so two very exciting uh, fields are um, looking at the flow of your coronary arteries um, by this uh, basically uh, vascular algorithm. And it can pick up not just where exactly uh, there's, there's a narrowing or a plaque, but also specifically the percentage to like to the to the T, um, which is much better than a radiologist just sort of eyeing something or cardiologist saying, oh, it's 50%. This will say exactly it's 37.3%. And then you can do some epigenetic changes, change your diet, change your nutrition, maybe take a nutraceutical, maybe work on your sleep and your stress, and then see if that number changes over time, rather than just saying, okay, come back in 10 years, we might put a stent and doing surgery. The other field of radiomics is looking at the fat layer called the epicardial fat of your coronary arteries. And that will show up uh, around areas of inflammation um, in the coronary arteries. That's not shown up with regular uh, imaging yet. So that's a very, very exciting technique it's coming from Europe. Uh, we are trying to bring that into Canada. Unfortunately, with modern medicine, sometimes going for Health Canada or FDA can take about a decade before you can get something that was um, authorized in Europe or Australia or South Africa to come to, to, um, to be used in clinical um, aspects. Uh, the other thing that's uh, fascinating is um, a lot of bacteria uh, in the body can cause inflammation in the heart. Um, and we can measure the inflammation now, again, years and years before the plaque uh, bolts up or ruptures. Um, one of the most important aspects where you can find these bacteria is in your mouth. So uh, there's ways to test uh, the oral bacteria and we know which ones are the good ones and which are the bad bacteria and we can then treat for that uh, or increase your, your oral hygiene. Uh, that's a simple mouth swab that we use. Um, fascinating results. And again, it can be repeated to see if are you actually doing uh, better. Um, the other is a blood test um, from a company in San Diego, uh, where we can look and see if you've got any unstable plaque lesions. Uh, it looks at um, a myriad of uh, biomarkers, there's about eight biomarkers, and we can predict your heart age due to inflammation if you have plaque. And again, this is something that you can do years and years before you develop full-blown cardiovascular disease. And again, you can repeat it. It's a simple blood test. You can repeat it and see, okay, is my exercise pro program working? Is my nutrition working? Is my supplement program working? Is my pharmaceutical program working? Um, which, is, uh, which is really good. And then the last thing in heart, uh, very fascinating, um, all of you probably know what mitochondria are. Uh, and for those of you who needs a reminder, it's the inside of your cells, basically the energy producers um, uh, or furnace, as you say, takes glucose and oxygen and makes energy in the, in the form of ATP. So your heart is full of uh, mitochondria because uh, it has to pump so, so for the rest of your life, of course. And um, I've always... Um, in, in functional medicine, we try and restore the mitochondria because mitochondria gets devastated by as we age, as we rust or what, what we call oxidative stress, um, as we um, eat things that we're not supposed to or drink things that we're not supposed to or don't exercise, the mitochondria start dying. Uh, interesting enough, we get all of our mitochondria from our mom. So to get an idea of how much mitochondria, have to look at your mom's health. Um, so if we can restore, we can regenerate mitochondria and exercise is one of the most important ways to do that. Um, the, the, the high intensity inter, uh, uh, interval training or um, at least a good eight hours of restorative sleep. 
but some people it's really, really hard to do that. So um, there are some supplements, Ubiquinol, CoQ10, B12, carnitine. I can give you a hundred different ways to, to help your mitochondria. But I've always wondered, well, can't we just replace the mitochondria like we replace hearts and lungs and kidneys and you name, you name it. Um, and about three years ago, a company, well, a Boston uh, pediatric hospital, uh, children's hospital, was able to restore mitochondria in um, little premature babies who developed uh, what we call pediatric cardiomyopathy, is where the muscle is so weak, uh, it's a, a genetic problem. Uh, they either need a new heart or... Um, there's really nothing else in medical science, but uh, three years ago, they took mitochondria from muscles of these uh, premature babies, a little biopsy, and within one hour, they were able to isolate the mitochondria and then with direct injection into the heart muscle, able to restore and a significant amount of these babies, the hearts were restored. So it's really not even science fiction anymore. It's already been done. So the, the future is really figuring out how to get um, mitochondria transplants, people with Alzheimer's, heart disease, if you ever had a heart attack, how to do that. Currently, uh, I know um, Hamilton, uh, the hospital of Hamilton has done stem cell injections and have been able to show some recovery there, but we really wanna do, uh, replace it with, with uh, full-blown mitochondria. So that's a very exciting thing to look forward to. If you, if you didn't behave yourself uh, as, as much as you should have for the first 50 years, uh, at least there's hope no fast, uh, hope for us. Interesting. So, you know, uh, I guess the takeaway for me there is that the, the level of testing that you're doing through health code and that is available out there, and this isn't stuff that's, you know, for most of what you talked about, it's not like years down the road. It's You can diagnose that heart disease and cardiovascular health and everything today. Right. Um, so, you know, again, those tests are available. Um, we do have a question here. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, Dr. Venter. Uh, we can, we can read it. Yeah, we can read it out for you. So there's a yeah. question coming in from Ricky in the chat here about how you feel about the way test scores are determined. So Framingham versus QRISC versus ACC versus the New Zealand PREDICT. And also a follow-up to that is, are there any thoughts on the early data that's coming out of exosome-coded stents for healing vascular injury and damaged tissue repair? Yeah, so the first one, the, the heart health, uh, the Framingham one is uh, basically it's a small area in uh, Framingham, uh, which is in uh, New York State. And basically it's a bunch of middle-aged old white men so if you want to know at your risk and, and you fill in that category, it's, it's reasonable. Uh, most of these ones, we really don't have a great Canadian one, uh, especially with us being multicultural and women are really not represented in most of these groups. So um, calculation is like statistics. Um, you, know, you know all the saving about lies, damn lies and statistics. So uh, I'd, I'd like to test. Uh, I don't like to guess. I probably just check somebody who's right in front of me and say, hey, this is your actual risk, uh, your actual heart age, your actual vascular age, your actual brain age. Let's do something about it rather than, I've had people with 6% cardiovascular still have heart disease. So I, I don't trust that so much, but we do of course use it as a barometer um, because if you refer to a cardiologist, at least a conventional cardiologist, which about 99% of cardiologists still are in the world. Uh, they wanna look at those numbers, but uh, I certainly, that's not my driving force. As, as of uh, exosome coded stents, uh, we'll just break it down. So exosomes are fascinating new field of medicine uh, where uh, these are little pockets or vesicles that contain growth factors. This is really the magic behind stem cells um, and uh, this is what delivers the growth factors and the signaling factors to the tissue that needs to be repaired. Um, so we are starting to look at exosomes for diagnostic purposes. Uh, you can see um, 
if somebody is developing Alzheimer's by looking at exosomes containing amyloid in the blood. So there are blood tests being developed for, um, for Alzheimer's, um, which is quite exciting, but scary at the same time. Um, or you can use exosome as treatment. Uh, one of our partners at Health Coast in the Bay Area, and he's been using exosomes probably for the last three or four years um, to help with um, arthritis, um, uh, uh, patients with COVID uh, or long haul COVID, uh, people with um, uh, uh, all kinds of degenerative issues. So uh, there's, there's some hope with uh, uh, cardiovascular disease as well as, 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 as dementia and concussion. So uh, the problem with stents, in most cases, is a foreign body, and the, uh, the body does not like foreign bodies, so it usually makes scar tissue. So um, what was a Canadian or really a Vancouver invention is they decided to coat um, these stents, which are mostly metal stents, uh, with a layer so your body doesn't reject it. And for most part, that is helpful, although for about at least three to 12 months, you have to take a blood thinner which most people don't like doing because you can cut yourself shaving or can get nosebleeds. Um, so exosomes uh, itself, uh, if it's the right factor inside the exosome, which will help with healing, it's great. If it's the wrong exosome and it can cause um, more inflammation or scar tissue, that, that, that wouldn't be a great idea. So, um, so I think fascinating uh, to look at and uh, really, we can see the data uh, in the long term. I think that, that that's a, a definitely a way to to uh, to look at. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Brenner. Um, in the essence of time, if it's okay, the the second I, I guess leading category that people chose was brain health uh, as it relates to dementia or Alzheimer's. So, if you could kind of give us your latest thoughts and testing on that, that would be great. So. Yeah, so brain health, very important that I tell people all the time, you only have one. And I haven't found anybody who's still alive after a brain transplant. So um, you have to really look after your brain for now until you can upload it into the digital realm like uh, Ray Kurzweil is doing and a few other people are hoping to do. So the, the first real thing about brain health is to know that whatever affects your heart, of, all, of course, affects your brain. So if you're starting to have heart problems, you've shortness of breath, you're not as fit, you know that your brain is not doing so great. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the brain doesn't have pain. Things like migraines really is uh, your blood vessels that get um, inflamed. And something like a brain tumor is the swelling and the pressure is really the brain itself. So the brain can't tell you there's something wrong. And most people think, oh, having um, misplaced their keys or forgetting people's phone numbers or faces is just part of aging. And really it isn't. Um, so at Health Code, we've been using um, radiomics, specifically volumetric, uh, volumetric MRI, where we do a 15 minute brain scan. Uh, it's MRI, so it's non-invasive, no radiation, um, and the uh, an artificial intelligence uh, uh, company within six minutes can do the calculations and it measures the different parts of the brain uh, for volume and compares front to back, left to right, to a database, your own age and your own gender. And it goes up to into the 90s. Uh, FDA clear database, European clear database, uh, currently research based in, in Canada. Um, I have about three, four years experience of it. And it can really show you if your brain is starting to shrink years and years before um, you would really know that there's a condition like Alzheimer's and all that. So if you know where the brain and how much the brain is shrinking for yourself, you can then find the root causes. And this is what Dr. Dale Bredesen, who was the founding president of uh, the Buck Institute of Research of Aging at just outside of San Francisco. Uh, this is about a billion dollar endowed research um, clinic 
that just been churning out the research on on brain specifically they do other conditions but mostly the brain and, and he's really found that if you can diagnose alzheimer's very very early and he really thinks you can diagnose it as early as 40 um, you can do things to to change the trajectory of the disease or at the very least slow it down uh, he has published uh, quite successfully and um, showing that uh, in over 100 patients, you can uh, indeed uh, restore um, the, uh, the, 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 the brain capacity. And specifically, there's, we look at the hippocampus, which is the part of your brain that has to do a lot to do with memory. And so, for instance, if the brain scan comes back, your hippocampus percentile, meaning how um, much a difference from the database is, say, a 10%. Um, they've restored people back into the 90%. So it takes at least a year. Uh, it's not a pull, it's a program, I always tell people. Uh, people have asked uh, in the chat box, I'll just put it in, it's Dale Bredesen. And he's written um, uh, several uh, books, two books um, out. I think there's actually a third book with a, uh, with a diet plan uh, coming or menu plan coming out later this year. Um, it's been validated several, several studies across the, the world. And um, it's, of course, not FDA approved because it's not a single poll that the FDA wants. It's a program. So uh, in functional medicine, we uh, individualize uh, for that. And he specifically is a functional medicine practitioner as well and a colleague of mine. So um, I just shared a uh, link to his book um, called okay. The End of the Liners. Yeah. So for those of us that are in Canada, you can pick it up at Indigo. Dr. Brenner, thanks for uh, for sharing that on brain health and dementia and Alzheimer's. And what I found really interesting is the link between cardiovascular health or heart health and brain health. Because you know what I kind of one of my takeaways was that it's it's very related. Like in other words, if you have good cardiovascular health and everything's working well, then you're getting the blood to your brain and and helping. You know, you're really solving a few issues there, right? So, yeah, super. Maybe. If I could do one more quick thing, just uh, really exciting is uh, Dr. Neil Cashman is a UBC professor. I think he's sort of close to retirement, but his whole life work has been on protein misfolding, meaning how the protein folds. So the really big culprit in, um, in dementia is the amyloid folding, uh, which is a protein that typically we use it actually as an anti-inflammatory, almost like a Band-Aid. But in uh, certain conditions, this protein becomes toxic and it starts misfolding. And that's really what causes the plaque and the tangles. Um, so very short story, uh, he and his team are developing an Alzheimer's vaccine. Uh, so hopefully in the future, this uh, will be uh, fascinating to, to see as we go through all the stages of trials. It's nowhere close to being done, although it's been done in animals. Uh, they need a few more years to do it in, in uh, human studies. And the most exciting about the Pfizer, uh, Moderna, mRNA, mRNA um, vac vaccines that they seems to be going to be a carrier uh, uh, technology for developing Alzheimer's vaccines. There's a vaccine being released very soon for melanoma uh, called Nuvax, and they are, are working on other personalized cancer vaccines as well. Uh, Germany has been uh, way ahead of there, so. Wow, <clears throat> amazing, you know? It's amazing because most people aren't aware that all these different uh, tests and procedures are even out there, right? So yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, Vanessa asked, what was our third category? Because we'll finish. Um, it was, it was mental health. Um, so still very deeply tied to brain health, but I'm, I'm sure Dr. Wenner, you can throw in a little bit from the sleep side of it as well into that. So I'll let you take that forward. Yeah, I think uh, never has there been a more important time for mental health than uh, in this really much, uh, I believe they're now saying parts of the world is in the fourth wave of COVID. Um, so as people have lost loved ones, people have lost uh, heroes, people have lost their own health. People have lost jobs. People have lost source of income. It's it's really impacting, and and I, I don't think we're going to know the full impact 
for probably a few years because we're still in the midst of it. Um, so uh, improper sleep for certainly um, disrupting sleep, as you know that we need about eight hours of um, restorative sleep. So if you're coughing, if you have pain, uh, if you're worried, um, that, that certainly will impact on your brain's capacity of restoring itself. Um, there's, a, there's an uh, absolute increase in suicide and PTSD as well. And I think it's important to know that inflammation itself um, can cause uh, these thoughts. Um, the, the, the typical saying about there is that for those of you who are men on the, on the call, the so-called man flu, uh, that you just wish you're gonna die. Um, that's a thing and it's your body's making interferon that forces you to stay in bed so you don't spread. Um, so um, that very thing, unfortunately, as COVID and other related viruses stays in our body and makes this sort of enhanced immune system or your immune system of Rex, uh, can make that interfere on last months. There's people now over 13, 14 months still sick with long old COVID. So, um, so that's really a big impact on mental health. Um, some um, exciting things that are coming down the line for treatment. Um, uh, a company out of New York, uh, what I'm working with is something called Infraslow Neurofeedback, where you wear sensors on the scalp and you regulate your brain waves. Uh, and it basically works semi automatically. Uh, it's been now used at home as well because of COVID. Um, the uh, whole field of quantified um, breathing, where we all know we should all breathe better. And whether you've done a Wim Hof course or box breathing, you sometimes just never know if you're doing it right. Uh, so quantified breathing is really just wearing sensors, either one sensor or two sensors, just to see what is your rhythm of breathing. And at the same time, is that relaxing you? So I think that's very important. I wish kids will get taught this in school. Um, the uh, other really interesting thing in mind is uh, the whole field of neurostimulation, whether it's with magnetic energy called PEMF, and there are all kinds of devices now that you can wear almost like a halo or a top, even like headphones that will help you deal with anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, um, cranial electrostimulation um, is really coming in its own where you wear electrical uh, notes either in your ears or in your neck uh, or even on your, on your scalp and that sends an electrical signal, very weak signal that will help with anxiety and depression. Uh, uh, one of the biggest um, antidotes to anxiety, PTSD and suicide is the flow state and the flow state is the part of your um, uh, mental health where you uh, feel your best and you perform your best. Uh, so those of you um, ski or snowboard or parasail or even just fold laundry, uh, you can put yourself in a flow state and much easier when you're younger, it gets all young, uh, harder when you get older. So there's a way of stimulate the flow state if you find the right spot in the brain and there are, are ways that we that we can do that uh, and instantly put people into a flow state. Um, and then um, a really interesting uh, field of medicine is um, uh, invasive radiology or injections. And the body, the people know about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, basically the sympathetic nervous system uh, makes us move away from danger or move towards a fight, or you can just freeze. And there's a way of switching that off instantly, um, uh, specifically using a stellate ganglion block. The sympathetic nervous system sits like chains, uh, like uh, nodes down your uh, spinal cord. And ganglion means a node. And there are two, there's a left and a, and a right. So you can block that um, with, usually as an interventional radiologist who does it or an ephetist. 
and that can be instantly uh, give relief to people. And that's usually followed up then by something like intravenous, nasal or sublingual ketamine that relaxes the nervous, uh, the, the nervous system so that you can do a reset. And because that's what we all need, we need a reset. So we, we have a colleague in the States and we're gonna bring that technology to Vancouver once everything is uh, settled down. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Renner. And, and I agree. I mean, we, um, through Advoca, we do a lot of different testing. And, and uh, one of the ones is pharmacogenics, which basically says what, you know, what or what medications will work on your body or your system based on your genetic makeup. And uh, in particular, with mental health, it's been very beneficial for a lot of people. So it takes the guesswork out of, out of mental health. And on the sleep, I mean, we, that's probably the biggest issue that we see that people are facing right now is sleep issues, right? So um, the good news is, is, you know, again, just to summarize what I'm hearing is you're, you have a testing available and solutions that are out there for people, right? Okay. Um, so I, if we can just maybe in the next four or five minutes, um, COVID is obviously the, the, uh, the topic on all of our minds right now. Um, so I know it wasn't listed in your top 10 or the top 10 conditions, but I, if you could maybe help our listeners in terms of a, what, and I'll say what supplements, what medications, or what can people be doing, let's say to either prevent COVID or if they're going to get it to, to, um, fend off the symptoms of it. And then num number two, like your just, uh, impression on the COVID vaccine and, and your thoughts on that. Yeah, as far as for uh, pre definitely prevention is 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 key, especially as the new variants come in. Just uh, everybody's got COVID fatigue, everybody's tired, wearing masks and washing hands. But this is actually now the time to really hunker down as we find out if these vaccines are helpful against the variants, and, and we know that it does reduce morbidity and chance of being hospitalized or getting into the ICU. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, so uh, if you, I mean, speak to your doctor, see if you can or need to be vaccinated, which uh, I always tell people who are worried about the vaccines. Um, and part of it's because it's, it's all new. It's only been a year. I remind people it's a novel co coronavirus. We never had this before. And we've had people with blood clots from COVID. We've had people with strokes from COVID, we have people with heart attacks with COVID, and uh, people in their 30s now are getting hospitalized. Um, colleague of my uh, cousin just uh, died uh, at 35, and they they even they couldn't even do an autopsy because of uh, COVID. So ne no, nobody would really know if there was an underlying cause. So what you can do yourself uh, from an immune standard is making sure you get your eight hours of sleep, make sure you exercise, uh, a lot of people are drinking more, uh, which is not great. So reduce your alcohol intake really only to one or two drinks on a weekend. Uh, keep your exercise up, uh, keep your colorful vegetables, probably very, very important. Uh, thankfully, we've got sun back in Vancouver. Hopefully it'll last for the next few, few weeks. Um, so get at least 20 to 30 minutes of sun on your um, exposed arms without sunscreen at first, and then you can put the sunscreen on after half an hour uh, to get your vitamin D. Um, you can either do a blood test or um, to check for zinc, zinc levels, but about 70 to 80% of people are low in zinc. So you probably can't go wrong for at least a 20 milligram of zinc. zinc. And then um, we found that quercetin, which is a nutraceutical, and I'll put it in the chat box here. Um, it's a nutraceutical made from uh, the skin of onions um as well as nac helps to boost your immune system so i think those those really four vitamin d zinc quercetin and nac uh really important just to get below your belt and for those of you who can't sleep magnesium with glycine uh, glycine is an amino acid that helps uh to calm the nervous system so that that combination is very powerful compared to say taking magnesium citrate or magnesium malate, magnesium glycinate, very good for sleep and stress and anxiety. Um, 
So things down the line that we're using in health code is uh, nasal photo decontamination. We use an infrared laser with uh, an activating agent um, that's been shown to kill uh, the virus um, instantly. And you can do a couple of treatments in one day. Um, there's a Vancouver company using nitric oxide nasal sprays, uh, kills the um, virus instantly. Um, that's not on market yet. The photo decontamination has been on the market for 10 years. These um, nitric oxide nasal spray, I'm hoping with the current crisis that it would be allowed pretty quick. Nitric oxide, very, very um, uh, safe uh, in, the, in, the, in the right dosage. And then uh, probably the biggest uh, thing to look at, and this might get special approval very quickly, is the Merck capsule um, or Nupervir, which is a, a nucleoside analog. It sort of works very close to an HIV drug, which is another nucleoside analog. And we found that combinations of these is probably what we're going to look for. And um, uh, specifically, the study that I showed the FDA is in 47 people with COVID, zero of them had COVID after five days. So that's pretty incredible for oral capsule. So no IVs or sprays or injections you have to worry about. Excellent, good. Um, and you know what, it's, I read a study that said, I've, I, if I'm quoting it right, 87% of people that were diagnosed with COVID had insufficient vitamin D levels. And that, that was one of, uh, one of your remedies. So, uh, and magnesium and zinc, great suggestions. Um, and in terms of the vaccine itself, um, yeah, the, the, uh, I, I see the U.S. Army now is developing a vaccine. We know the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are at least 91% efficacious uh, if it's given in time. Um, questions are still abound about the Johnson & Johnson um, and the AstraZeneca. The AstraZeneca is controversial right now, uh, so we need to look more data. So. Um, I do remind people that even at 65% efficacy, it's still better than zero, and it's still better than to get uh, COVID. Um, biggest biggest problem really is the asymptomatic spread now in young people, and hopefully it will be uh, offered to young people. Like they, they know that the vaccines are safe up to about 12 years of age. Um, uh, so really, that's that's really where I've uh, got 14, 16, and 18 year olds. So. They really, uh, they're the ones that are more at risk. They, as people said, the, the young people are our essential workers. They're the door dashers and the skip the dishers and uh, the, the waiters and your servers and your ski instructors or your helpers. So they really are the ones that need to be protected as well. So hopefully um, um, the vaccines will get better and better. I know Moderna can already boost their variants and they're already working on that. Uh, as these, this P1 variant, uh, which I now believe BC is leading the world in, uh, uh, that, that came from Brazil, um, that we'll learn how to boost and, and how uh, to make the vaccines more effective. Uh, specifically, I think the vaccines will be more effective as well if your vitamin D and your zinc and your question and your sleep and your neck is uh, the N-acetylcysteine uh, is the, the longer version of neck. Uh, if that those levels are adequate um, and you exercise, you know, drink too much, I think you'll get a much better bang for a buck. Excellent. Okay, Dr. Vendner, thank you on behalf of everyone. And I'll just wrap things up here uh, if it's okay. Um, so thank you again. I mean, you're just, uh, the, the knowledge that you have is amazing. And uh, it's one of the reasons so many of our clients at Advoca use your services. So thank you again for joining us today. I think we do, we will need to have another uh, podcast because uh, we didn't get to a lot of topics today. Um, so just to wrap up in terms of Advoca, because we're always asked, you know, what does Advoca do? And, and and what's our purpose? And um, as I said earlier, really Advoca's mission is to help people live long and healthy lives. And you can see, you know, the, the chart here on the left in front of you, it's very confusing right now when it comes to health, everything from virtual health to nutrition, to, uh, to functional medicine, preventative, uh, uh, preventative medicine testing. A lot of people don't know where to go or how to get that. And that's one of the reasons that we partner with a, um, a great organization like Health Code, because they help our members stick handle and get the very best health solutions uh, moving forward. 
Um, to put it another way, uh, on the next chart, you can see that we just, essentially the best way to think of Advoca Health is we are a network of networks. So no matter what your health condition or testing or health situation, instead of trying to figure it out and where do you go and where's the best treatment or where's the best testing, we will figure that out for you um, as a member uh, of our program. Um, so we do have different programs we offer um, to uh, individuals, to presidents, to executive groups, to employees. So we have different programs uh, ranging in price from as low as $12 a month um, up to $119 a month for a family. Um, so any information that anybody wants on our program, be pleased to, uh, to help you. So in terms of uh, reaching out to us, um, the, and we'll send these slides to you, but uh, my email's there, so please feel free. Any questions or if you'd like to connect, uh, please feel free. Our website is there as well. I also write my own personal health blog just on my own health journey. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I just finished and just released last week my latest book, um, and it's called It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy. And it actually, I'll say in layman's terms, talks about a lot of the things that Dr. Ventner talked about today in terms of sleep and sleep patterns and exercise and diet and how all those things fit together. So if you're interested there, you can click on there and, and order the book as well. So Dr. Vendor, thank you so much again. Um, really, really appreciate your time. And I know by all the comments that are coming through, um, all of our listeners uh, do as well. So thanks so much. And I'll just say in closing, I wish everybody a super healthy day. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Thanks, Dr. Wendner. Take care. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.